So uh, hi everyone, welcome to lecture 12 uh, of uh, systems medicine. Um, I said last time this will be the last lecture, but actually this I decided to add it. Yeah, it's a very festive. Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, um, I have so much I uh, want to share with you this, uh, to, add, to add a lecture. So we'll do the final lecture next week. Is that a problem for any, anyone? So in the final lecture. Next week. And we have now uh, lecture notes. Lecture notes 11 are online. And so is exercise 5. Number 5. Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and today, last, yesterday, last time, we talked about um, depression, major depression disorder as a bistable system. We're going to stay on the dark side, talk about addiction. I don't mean uh, being addicted to a TV series. I mean the hard stuff, <coughs> heroin, opiates, alcohol, nicotine. Prescription of drugs, amphetamines, cocaine, and the kind of things that. Ah, yeah, this is the music. No, anyway, I was trying to find songs about addiction. Okay. It's hard. Cocaine, right? So it's hard to find songs that are not about addiction. <laughs> Try to find a song that's not about addiction. Cocaine, for example, this song by uh, JJ Kim. <laughs> If you want to get down, down to the ground, cocaine. You know this song? If you want to get hang out, you gotta take her out, cocaine. She don't lie, she don't lie, she don't lie, cocaine. So why does cocaine not lie? What does that mean? It's because you can't think of anything else. You just want to get that cocaine. There's no Things that used to give you pleasure, like maybe getting a hug or eating some chocolate, don't work anymore. The only way you can survive, basically, is if you get the cocaine. So it's, first, it gives you euphoria, but then you just need it in order to feel normal. Because if you don't take it, you feel withdrawal symptoms, which are horrible, including um, depression, anxiety, shivers, vomiting, things crawling on your skin. Uh, uh, in some, for some things, withdrawal symptoms can even be deadly, so really bad. So you, you want that cocaine or opiates or nicotine or alcohol and just to stay normal, just to stay fine. Okay, so it eats up more and more of your life, your, hurts your relationships, your work, and, and can kill you because it, when you overdose, you can, you can die from it. So, Big killer, uh, alcohol overdose, major killer. There's uh, opiates, a uh, number of people addicted to painkillers basically. Uh, went up four times in the last 20 years. Huge problem in the US. Lots of uh, teenage deaths from overdose, mixing alcohol and opiates. Uh, so, terrible, terrible epidemic. That's what we're going to talk about and sing about. <laughs> All right, so uh, and basically, the interesting thing that we want to understand is actually a universal uh, graph you can draw that is shared for all these different chemicals. And these different chem chemicals, like uh, ethanol and, and alcohol and cocaine, so they act on the brain in different ways but they have a shared kind of um, phenomenon of addiction. This, this phenomenon is universal. Um, what should you call it? Universal, what should you call it? Curve? Addiction curve. Addiction curve. Universal curve. Addiction. 
I'm just going to try to forget. Le yesterday, last, last, last time, we talked about depression model. Okay. I want to say who did that model, Avichai Denver. Are you here, Avichai? So Avichai, it's his last week in his PhD. So let's give him some applause. Avichai is graduated. And the model today about addiction is by Omer Karim. Towards the last year or so of the speech. Where's Omer? So uh, when you think about addiction, all these addictions, weeks, months, years, there's an initiation. So on the y-axis is and otherwise it's craving. It's how much you want it. So there's a first phase called initiation phase. And then um, and you use it, it's fine. And then you get uh, euphoria or, or emotional high. So this is a, so you, it makes you feel really good. Whatever it is. And so you, keep, you seek it. You keep wanting to do it. So this is the initiation phase. And then you have the maintenance phase. Where the four is gone. But if you stop it, you feel very bad. You have these withdrawal symptoms. So you take it just to keep feeling normal. Right? So in this phase, it's positive reinforcement. Euphoria makes you keep seeking it. Here it's negative reinforcement. It's the withdrawal agony that makes you keep doing it. You basically learn a behavior like this, and you keep seeking the behavior. And then, once you've had enough, or you're forced to whatever, go to a rehab, you stop uh, using it. That's the line here. And then you have the withdrawal phase. So the first few hours, days, is the craving goes up, and it's very bad withdrawal syndrome. And then the craving goes down gradually over weeks. And let's say rehab. It could be, let's say, 70 days program, something like that. For example, in Amy Winehouse's song about rehab, she actually says, I don't have time, I don't have 70 days, right? She says, uh, you know that song? Want me to go to rehab and I say no, no, no. I know I've been black, but when I get back, you all know, no, no. Daddy thinks I'm fine, and I don't have the time. He want me to go to rehab, and I say no, no, no. So it takes time. And uh, one thing we want to understand is the time scale, what happens. And then after, after withdrawal, there's a period which can take months, years, where it's, you're prone to relapse. Relapse means um, you're clean now, but you go back to the, back to the addiction. So what, what is this relapse? Why does it happen? What's the time scale? Very that, important. That's for life, right? Huh? That's for life. It's for life, yeah. But maybe more sensitive in the beginning. And, and for many reasons. And, and now, during this maintenance period, I mentioned that there's euphoria. So euphoria and euphoria goes away. If you want more euphoria, you need to increase the dose. Because this original dose you got to doesn't, doesn't cut it anymore. So you increase the dose, you get another, a little bit more euphoria, but then you need to increase the dose some more. This phenomenon is called Tolerance. You need to increase those to get, let's 
the same effect. And that occurs during the maintenance? Yeah, maintenance phase. And of course, there's all kind of adaptations. Like for alcohol, um, over years, some people, their body gets better at kind of adapting to alcohol, so you can end up drinking two liters of alcohol, which will maybe kill you if you just started with two liters. You get tolerant in that way. And then people increase their dose, but you can't increase forever because there's a limit. Where at some point, uh, it's become toxic, or you don't have enough money, or you don't have enough time, or so. All right, so uh, tolerance, and uh, tolerance, yeah? If the limit is not money-related, if yeah. you can drink however much you want, yeah. it's not toxic. Yeah. Is there a limit where beyond it, you will be in euphoria because it just, it just works? I don't think so. And the question is, if, if, if it's not toxic and there's no, you, you have unlimited supply. Um, so that's a, that's a fantasy, as Muddy Waters wrote in his song, <coughs> if the river was whiskey. But it doesn't work because you have some receptors in your brain, and at some point they, they get all saturated and you can't. And then there's uh, adaptation mechanisms. Muddy Waters wrote this. If the river was whiskey and I was a diving duck, if the river was whiskey and I was a diving duck, I'd dive right to the bottom, never would I come up. So it's, it's probably what's going to happen to you if you dive to the bottom. But <laughs> so I was really trying to find songs about addiction. And, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of songs. So somewhere in here is the songwriting phase. <laughs> so you be here, you be here. Here, here, different songs. Um, so I, do, I, I, I don't believe there'll be a situation like that. Um, it's kind of tragic, maybe, or maybe, maybe it's actually good, I don't know. And something about the human condition keeps us n uh, not able to be in euphoria forever, and we'll discuss that towards the end of the lecture. I think that's part of our drive to um, be able to adapt to changing environments. Um, okay, so we talked about initiation, maintenance, withdrawal, tolerance, and re positive and negative reinforcement. And what happens, what is this uh, biochemical basis of addiction? So um, each of the addictive substances has its own suspected me mechanisms. And you can say in general, it's a matter of research, but one of the most addictive things is called the heroin or morphium or op opiates, this family. So I just want to tell you about that. Um, so the way it works is that I'm going to draw a neuron here. That's an inhibitory neuron. It inhibits other neurons. And this neuron has receptors here. And these are the op opioid receptors. Now, the body makes, our body makes a kind of morphine that's a, like a painkiller and a euphoric. So it's endogenous morphine, morphine, or actually what's called is endorphin. So maybe you've heard about endorphins released after you do exercise, give you a runner's high. Have you heard about that? Huh? Or you get birth. When you give birth, yeah, you get a lot of better endorphins, and uh, uh, we give you euphoria and pain killing, so that's good, right? Very important for giving birth. And the reason you have them, by the way, is because the placenta acts like the H in the HP axis, secretes X1, then makes the pituitary secrete X2, and X2 is linked, part of X2 is better endorphins. It goes from placenta, we'll talk about that thing. So this is better endorphin, better endorphin. And, and it binds these receptors and inhibits this neuron from inhibiting other neurons. So other neurons secrete neurotransmitters like dopamine. They're uh, 
connected. So there's an electrical signal here, converted to a chemical signal, dopamine, that converted back to an electrical signal here. That's how neurons work. So when you have these endogenous morphines of endorphins, they bind the receptors and inhibit the inhibition. So basically, they activate this dopamine. And then here's some what's called neuro blah blah. Okay, so somehow this dopamine in certain areas of your brain reward centers gives you a feeling of euphoria and high. And in other centers of the brain, it's a painkiller. So this is give you euphoria. Painkiller. But th that's endogenous morphine. There's also exogenous, means it comes from the outside. There's natural products of the poppy flower, like morphium, opium, and they bind the same receptors, and their morphium is a nice painkiller, and, morph and opium is a very addictive drug. Why addictive? Because this euphoria basically and reward basically makes you want, it's exactly the thing the pleasure, this endorphin is the pleasure you get. It's not the pleasure. It's a chemical that's most closely associated, we can find, to the pleasure that you want to seek again. That's why they're so addictive. It's exactly the, the point. It's not dopamine, it's the endorphin. It's dopamine. And so, oh, more, and then there's some um, chemically synthesized analogs, which are these famous painkillers that you can buy, you can get prescribed which are uh, very addictive too. So, so you see that this gives you this euphoria and painkilling for this st stage, but once you, to get to you have tolerance, if you don't take them, you have the opposite of euphoria and painkilling. You have anxiety and pain. It's just part of the withdrawal. Now why is there tolerance? It's kind of a mystery. So the reason for tolerance, so there's a theory for tolerance, that the receptors get downregulated. What does that mean? <coughs> so here there's a lot of dopamine. A lot of dopamine, a lot of dopamine, blah, blah, blah. And the brain wants to find balance, and therefore it starts removing receptors. It could be internalizing them and Desitosing them or phosphorylating them, making make them bind less actively. And that's another drug, for instance, cocaine. What cocaine does is a different mechanism. Cocaine blocks the reuptake of dopamine and other neurotransmitters, so also increases dopamine. It's like the SSRIs blocking the reuptake, blocks the reuptake. therefore giving you euphoria, painkiller, I don't know the thing, the euphoria, because it different, depends on the brain region. And then and also has these receptor down regulation. So the problem is, this can explain, this explains effects on the scale of hours, because that's how long it takes to get rid of receptors. But, but a lot of aspects of tolerance take weeks, and also last, week, last for weeks after, after you stop. And the receptors come back within hours after you stop. The tolerance, that's to say, in this region, you still need a very high dose to get the effect for weeks. So there's a mystery about the time scale of tolerance, how exactly it works. And uh, each you have to, the receptors are different for each substance and you need to explain it. And so what I'd like to do with you is to, um, to look outside the brain, to look at the HPA axis, and see how it can explain this universal curve, the time scales, and, and, and even discover a new phenomenon, a new middle zone, like a late zone of recovery that connected to relapse. Still not, not well characterized. And receptor theory, time scale, opiates, better endorphins, reward, and alcohol, I should say alcohol also is thought to bind receptors and make them more sensitive to neurotransmitters. So, uh, 
it's not clear exactly. There's a lot of uh, things that alcohol does, cocaine does, etc. But there is one thing in common to all these different drugs, all the different addictive things. So alcohol, cocaine, opiates, and the active ingredient in, in cannabis, I think called ACP? THC. 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 And there's um, amphetamines and nicotine, all these are different things. They all, all of them, activate the HP axis. They all, in different ways, some of them directly, some of them indirectly, make H secrete X1, which goes to P, secretes X2, which goes to A, secretes X3. And then this shuts it down. So the classic HP axis that we've learned about. This is called CRH. So you look at the person in maintenance with alcohol, you see X3 level, cortisol levels that are high. And you see the person on cocaine, person. How different have less addiction? That's correct. So people have less, more likely or less likely to be addicted. I don't know how that works, yeah. Yeah. What about uh, gambling and sex addiction or maybe Facebook addiction? Yeah, so I would say they also activate. So there's definitely exercise addiction that activates this. And then gambling, I guess, would activate this. Sex. So. And stimulation, basically. But I don't, I'm not sure that everything that activates HP axis is also addictive. I, I wouldn't say that. But maybe it's a, maybe it's a necessary condition. I don't know that either, but we'll soon see how it can fit into this picture. So maybe there's other ways to get this also. OK, so what's the, what's the key link? The key link is that ACTH, this X2, is a signal that makes the adrenal sec secrete X3. But there's another important thing to know, that inside the pituitary cell, in order to make X2, X2 is a piece of protein that's cut out of a bigger protein called POMC and by some enzymes that cut, cut it. But, uh, but there's another piece of it that gets cut, and that piece is better endorphin. That's to say, with X2, the cell secretes better endorphin. So the source of painkiller and euphoric for the body is actually stoichiometric production, one-to-one -one production, with this signal. So we can think of X2 as beta endorphin for this purpose. And that's in the body. And in the brain, X1 in the brain makes neurons secrete beta endorphin. So there's brain act activity and there's body activity, like pain-killing activity and euphoria activity that are X1 and X2. So, so far we talked about X3 as the output. Now X1 and X2 are what's important for us in this three gland system. So, um, the rationale you can say is that if you have fight or flight response, it makes sense to have a euphoric and a painkiller to get you ready to face the stress. Um, right, so, and indeed, uh, experiments on the, on the alcohol, let's say alcohol abuse and the HPA axis, they show that, I, they show that, um, they, they test people, well, let's see, right here, right here, right here, and after a long time. And so scientists tested people with alcohol abuse where they're still addicted 
right? Let's say when it comes to the rehab center, in the middle of the rehab treatment, a few months later, and a few months later, to see what's going on with their HPA axis. And the way they did that is, um, the way this is the way endocrinologists test the HPA axis, what they do is they take a syringe and they inject X1 into it. CRH. And then they measure, they take blood every, let's say, 30 minutes or 15 minutes, and they measure X2 and X3. They want to see uh, how, how the pathway responds. And so what they notice is the following. So this is time, this is 0, 30, 60, 90 minutes, let's say. And I'm going to plot here X2 and X3. So a uh, normal person shows a response like this to the CRH test. A person with uh, al alcohol use shows more cortisol, but blunted ACTH response, which is a weird situation, which I'm going to try to explain. So high cortisol and low X2. So this is not the brain, this is here, X2 is, uh, is ACTH is what they measure here. What's your question? Is more receptors in the brain? No, there is a flow. Oh, why it's low? Yeah, we'll, we'll see in a second. Right? So, so this is called, um, this is worry, worrying for endocrinological is dysregulation because if X3 is high, X2 is also supposed to be high because they're, one activates the other. So what's going on here? And if we think about X2 being a sign for beta endorphin, what it means is that X, injecting some CRH is like similar when somebody gives you a hug. Somebody gives you a hug, you get input to the HPA axis. And you want to have some pleasure signal, some beta endorphin come out of it. But the problem in addiction is that the things that used to give you pleasure, like hug and chocolate and something, don't anymore. That's, that's this blunted extra response. It means it's called sometimes hedonic, or this we call it hedonic dysregulation. Hedonic uh, means like hedonistic. Hedonic means uh, pleasure. So there's, you get less pleasure from, from things that give you pleasure. And that situation lasts right when you stop, you go into rehab, a month into rehab. Then when you go out of rehab, your cortisol, after the CRH test, so this is normal, is fine. But your X2 is still blunted. It's called blunted. And only after a long time, both of them return to normal. So there's something here in the middle here where cortisol is fine, X3 is fine, X2 is still blunted. This Two stages of this regulation. That's, that's the fact. You can find that there's no explanation for this, but I'll tell, I'll tell you the explanation soon. So we want now, based on what we know and what we've done in this course, use this picture, HPA, these glands, the fact that you know, they divide the cells, what well, we added in this lecture, so in this course, cells divide and their control of the upstream hormones. We want to understand the basic facts of addiction. We understand why there's euphoria in the beginning. Why does it go away? Why is there tolerance? Why, why do you need to take higher and higher dose just to stay normal, to stay normal condition, not even to get euphoria? Why is it that when you withdraw, you have these terrible symptoms? And what is this relapse? What is this middle phase after you, you withdraw? And understand all of this based on the picture that you and uh, learn in this course. I'm going to say goodbye to all this stuff here.
So what we're going to do is we're going to look at our HPA equations and on the time scale of weeks, months. And we're going to start with the input, the input, which in our case will be uh, we start drinking or taking opiates or something at a certain time. Right? And then we're going to stop. So the, the important equations for us are, are the way the glands change, which, um, which we've written before. So now I want to plot x1 and x2 and x3, and the gland size p and the gland size a. These are all the variables that we have. And x2, remember, and x1 and x2 secrete beta, are like beta endorphins. So we, before we drink, we have our steady state level. What's the steady state level of x1? Steady state level of x1 is 8p, because that's the way to get zero here. Steady state level. And state level of x2 is 8p. So that's the way to get, that's, these equations set the steady state of these orbits. But once we increase u now in the HP axis, we make more x1, x2, and x3. So they rise. They rise. They rise. But look at this. The only way to get steady state is for them to return to their baseline. So something's going to happen, and within weeks, they're going to come back. What is this thing that happens? That, that's this property, this property of executive rotation. That's what you ask. You can't have euphoria forever. You, May, now, maybe you can keep raising the stimulus, we'll see. But for a step stimulus, you return back to baseline. That's the only way to get steady state. Why? What happens is that P increases in size and A increases in size. And when A increases in size, there's more cortisol, and cortisol shuts down X2 and X1, exactly to the extent where they get back to steady state. So that's the steady state. So the glands grow more cortisol, it shuts down those two hormones. So that's the tragedy of life here encapsulated in a mathematical form. You have increased stimulation, but your euphoria lasts only a few weeks. Okay, that's it, you can't, with this situation. Another way to say it is that the euphoria is X1 and X2, the bit of Take the, something like the derivative or the change, you look for the change in signal. So here the derivative is zero, here the derivative is zero, and here in the middle it's not zero. And they're like a kind of s smeared out derivative. So they like change, looking for change. And that's a, a clue for us for what this HPA factor is doing. It's giving you a reward for ch improvement. But if the improvement doesn't improve anymore, you stop getting the reward. See what I mean? All right, and uh, x3, uh, it turns out, it doesn't have executation, just x3 stays up as high as the signal. Because this is the, like a distress response or whatever, it doesn't adapt. P stays high, A stays high, until the withdrawal. So soon we'll talk about the withdrawal. Before that, I want to make another point about tolerance. Suppose now, before, I, I had a nice little stimulus. Okay, I would get a nice response. That's a normal HPA factor. But now I'm addicted. And suppose here I add the same stimulus. I get a very small response. Why do I get such a small response? This is this hedonic dysregulation, this inability to get pleasure from things that used to give me pleasure. And the reason is that because we have such a large adrenal, X3 is so high. It shuts down the responses. Another way to say this is this is blunted X2. When you in have some extra, you inject X1, you have this blunted X2. It's because of this large adrenal shutting down the production of X1, for example. That means in order to get the same, but, but you know, if I now increase and increase, I'll get some euphoria, right? I'll finally get some euphoria. 
question is, how much do I need to increase U now in order to get the same response? Okay, and, and this model has a beautiful answer to that. The answer is, in order to do that, I'm gonna, I need some dynamic range here. So I'm going to call this level 1 and this level 2. If I raise to 3, I don't get much of a response. I need to raise to 4. Let's just say, if I made a two-fold change here, I need to make a two-fold change here in order to get the same response. This, cir this circuit works for what's called fold change. You have to double your dose. So if you doubled your dose, you got a certain response. You have to double it again to get the same response. It's not that I, I went from 0 to 100 grams of alcohol. Now I drink another 100 grams. I shouldn't say zero to So I, said I went from an input that's equivalent to 100 grams of alcohol. This is my norm. Now I drink 100 grams, I get some response. If I drink another 100 grams, I won't get the same response. I need to drink 200 grams. Because I went from 100 to 200, now I need to from 200 to 400. Now to get the same response, I need to go from 400 to 800. And to get the same response from 800 to 1.6 liters. So that's a, that property is written inside these equations. I, uh, won't, I put it in the notes, I won't prove it to you now. It's called fold change detection, which means that the entire circuit responds to ratios. It cares about ratios. And a lot of human senses have that vision and hearing, you know, and we measure noise levels by decibels, which is a logarithmic scale. And, and also, also this circuit has that feature. You can prove mathematically, you'll see that in electronics. So that's a problem because you know you really have to exponentially increase the dose in order just to get the same euphoria. And that, that has a limit, of course, you can't do that forever. Right? So you get stuck at some limiting value. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the, the area that you have to increase the dose. Is that like the, the initiation phase? Yeah. yeah. So if you want to have the same euphoria, but not to get the addiction, you need to be in the time scale before the organ gets bigger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So Alexandra made a very important point that this, type, this, uh, re this addiction requires you being high, average you being high for weeks. So of course, it doesn't mean like 100% of the time you have high use. You drink, you drink, but you average that over a week. It's going up. up. When you drink once in a while, uh, in a moderate amount, you don't get an effect on your adrenal pituitary. And you get these little blips and things are fine. Yeah. Addiction requires um, weeks of increasing stimulation. That's interesting to, with this model, quantitate the trade-off between, or the, the relationship between dose and timing that can keep you on the safe side. So it's different with uh, different people and I agree. It's different for different people. Because different people probably have different time scales here. And, and different for different drugs because of the translation between the dose and the U that you get there, like the, how much they activate the HPA axis and maybe addi many additional things besides the HPA axis. Like for instance, opiates give you the better they give you the euphoria right away. They don't need to wait for the pituitary. Right? They're, they're like very addictive, very, very. Especially if you inject them. The thing about injecting the heroin is that it goes to the brain so quickly that it's easy for your brain to learn the connection. And then you seek that. That's the excited relief. <sighs> I'm getting a, a euphoria from seeing it. So. <laughs> yeah, it's really um, very nice. Very nice. Uh, so, does anybody know any other songs about addiction? If you want to get down, down to the ground, cocaine. So, let's get down to the ground. And uh, what happens when you stop? So, now you have. I adrenal, I pituitary, high cortisol, and they tell you to go to rehab and say no, no, no. If you still go, 
Right, what happens here? So what's going to happen is we have, we have a drop in u, right? So drop in u means less x1, less x2. So they go down. But because of this exact notation, they're going to go back up. So that's, that's the saving grace, right? It's not going to be held forever. It's going to just take some time for the system to go back. And x3 goes down like this. And p goes down. p and a do something interesting. But a goes down like this. I'll talk about p in a second. So you get a drop in beta endorphins in your brain, in your body. There's data measuring beta endorphins and giving an anxiety questionnaire to people who withdrew from alcohol. And you see a very clear relationship. Lower beta endorphins, more anxiety. So you have this pain and, and anxiety because of the lack of beta endorphins. And it's, it's especially acute right in the first few hours because in effect it's not in this model which is this effect of receptor down regulation so if you have a lot of neurotransmitter and you just have very few receptors you get a signal but what, now when you drop it down to normal levels you have a very very low signal and the, the brain wants to keep balance so upregulates the number of receptors over a day or so. And th that's like the, the hor horrible part is the first day or something because your receptors have to adapt. After that, there's the horrible part of the 70 day rehab like in the Amy Winehouse song where you have this low beta endorphins and high cortisol. So after about a one month or two month, your cortisol resolves. And here, when, when you solve these equations, so as you notice, you, Solving the equations is, uh, is a, uh, a wonderful way to make assumptions and then logically follow through what they mean. It would be very difficult to, to do this just by words because like the following thing I'm going to tell you. Because of this arrangement, U, H, P, A, when you stop the stimulation, it's P that starts adapting, shrinking, and then A that starts shrinking. What, you get a kind of an order, a, se a sequence like this. This is, this is the baseline of the Twitter cortical. They go down, and they go down, and then A is kind of following them. At this point, they're back to normal, but because A is large, it inhibits X1, which is their growth factor. So P keeps going down. It's like a little bit like that uh, oscillator I told you about. Not a make, P makes A grow, A makes P shrink. So it's like making a damped oscillation because we pulled it so hard with this addiction and we're letting it go, it does this more. And P has an undershoot and then it goes back to normal. So first A, A goes back, adrenal goes back to normal and then you go out of rehab, more or less. But then there's this extra phase here, let's say another three months. We have normal, this phase, you have normal x3, but blunted x2. That's exactly this thing. You have blunted blunted x3. And that's a new phase that we think exists in this withdrawal. We call it the mid-zone. We still don't have a good name for it, but maybe it's like a blues phase. It's linked with low beta endorphins. So a person with low beta endorphins feels anxiety and pain and that gets translated to whatever that means for that person. And that person is likely to want to increase beta endorphins. How do you increase beta endorphins? By increasing the input to the HPA axis. For example, exercise. It's a good way. Right? So if you're blue, as you said before, exercise give you some natural endorphins. But if you're used to, let's say, drinking alcohol in order to increase your bed endorphins, and then and you have you know, the right situation, friends, etc., you, um, you might be more prone to relapse in this phase. 
that's your way to do it. So we think there's a, another, let's say after you go to Bria, another three, four months of endocrine disbalance that's where you're prone to relapse. And of course, you're prone to relapse all your life. And what I want to do next is, is talk about the bright side. This is, a, this is a very dark lecture where our HPA axis makes us vulnerable to horrible thing, addiction, that's, as we said. Causes dysfunction, death. But it's the bright side of something. It's a, it's a side effect of something essential. I want to tell you what HP axis does. <laughs> we are ready for this uh, in the last lecture. But before I do that, I want to ask you to, because there's so much information, to turn to someone next to you, behind you, etc., and ask them questions or see if everything is clear with them, hear what their question is, to help you process all this um, universal addiction curve. Yeah. And then it takes time for them to go back again on the surface. 
Right. So that could be an internal, without any feedback, just an internal step kind of feedback to create like a delay in response. Yeah, for so a way. So what you're saying is, what I'm definitely saying is that you have the receptors can be stored inside the cell, and then it takes a time for them to return. So that's correct. And then the thing is that typically this takes hours, days. And we need an explanation for why it takes weeks for tolerance. And also weeks for tolerance to remain after you withdraw. So this is, must be an additional, maybe something else, methylation or something. What else? To build habits. Six to ten, ten weeks to build a habit. Yeah. And it's also you have to have like the and then you reward. Yeah. So you're saying maybe habit loops have a similar biology? Could be, of course, could be also brain regions get uh, rewired somehow and probably they do too. And so. But maybe it's connected also. I mean, I want to say something uh, very interesting about, very interesting about what the brain does. Uh, Suppo suppose you're used to drinking in the kitchen at 5 p.m. when you're cooking every day. You go to the fridge, take some wine. So this is, let's say, heart rate or body temperature or something like that. What wine does, it's a kind of depressant thing. It lowers your heart rate and blood pressure. So what the brain does at 5 p.m. when it learns the pattern is it raises your heart rate and in the kitchen. And then when you drink, the, the wine kind of brings it back to normal. So your brain anticipates what you're going to drink. But if you, if you don't have alcohol, you're stuck in the kitchen without alcohol, you open the fridge, there's no alcohol, you feel awful because of this extra compensation. That's incredible, right? So that means the, the people you were with, the place, the brain learns to, it could be years later, to compensate for the, so if it's say cocaine, cocaine raises our, our rate in temperature, so you, the brain does the opposite, it lowers, which also feels awful. So that, that's like another thing that can cause a relapse. Now, if another, the, the, another aspect of this is if you drink at an unfamiliar time, like a party at 11 p.m., your brain doesn't know to compensate. So your normal dose could be an overdose. And that's when overdose happens, typically. It's like the, the, the wrong time and place, or unusual time and place. So that's an interesting adaptation the brain that learns like the pattern over weeks. And that's another interesting thing about it, uh, addiction and signals which are very, uh, can be very complex. Isn't that amazing? And of course that has to do with habits and right now and addictive stuff, habits. And so what you're saying that if, uh, for, uh, for example, I used to drink at, at the evening and then I'm going, I'm going to the party at noon. I can be more drunk. Yes, then you can be more drunk. Yeah, you're asking if I used to drink in the evening a, a, a certain dose. The same dose can make you more drunk if you drink at a time you're not used to because you lack the brain's uh, anticipatory capacity to change physiology. Okay, so what other questions? Yeah. Uh, right now, so there are a lot of research that said that it's good to drink. Alcohol. Yeah. Now, if you want to say it's true, so the effect of the alcohol if you drink from regular time is like reversed and it does nothing basically. Okay, so you're saying there's research that says it's good to drink alcohol and, and that if you, because of this effect, if you drink it at the same time, it does nothing. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should say a little more about alcohol. Um, alcohol. Uh, at low levels in the blood and uh, causes some effects like euphoria and uh, slow speech 
this, this coordinated movement, things like that, some of which the brain can correct. But if you go to higher levels, you get alcohol-related um, damage, basically. Over the For example, you get classic things like a heart damage. You have this dilated heart with arrhythmias and, and liver fibrosis, because the liver has the job of detoxifying alcohol. And the brain can't, can't compensate for that. So that's these classic alcohol-related diseases, you know, fatty liver disease. And then there's a whole list. It's a really a, also <coughs> nicotine, of course. So I think maybe there's some research about mild, mild amount of alcohol, some effects there, uh, positive effects and negative effects. But I think lo high levels are, are, are pretty universally bad, bad for you. The brain can't, can't compensate for that. Did I answer your question? Uh? And was it randomized control trial? Yeah, so was it a randomized control trial? So there's a lot of criticism, I guess, about studies like that. And so there's the red wine effect with antioxidants. So maybe it's the antioxidants they call. Yeah, but who drinks wine every day at uh, lunch and wine? Right. So it's a debated field, I guess. I, I don't know much about it, but so since, I guess, part of our um, Part of our role in teaching is to teach like, critical thinking about scientific literature, so it's important to, to mention. And what other questions? Yeah. So, um, what the criteria and what bugs they have just basic human factors, right? right. It has this kind of whole change yeah. type response. Oh. So, so, is that just like baked into all? Okay. So, the question is systems? bacteria also have. Exactitation and full change detection as they do their search. Is this a common theme? So that's exactly where I'm going now. Now I want to reveal <laughs> um, what we think um, the HPA axis um, evolved to, to do for us. And it's the physiological purpose we think that has a dark side. The dark side, one of the dark sides is addiction. But you pay this price, you can say, because of something essential that the HPA axis does. So, and that essential thing is similar to what the bacteria do in their uh, world. So what I'm going to write down is that HPA axis can serve as a navigation system in the space of behavior. So first of all, we used to call this stress input, but I want to make it more general. I'm going to call it stimulation input. Why do I say that? Because stimulation or the input stim Relation. You, we wrote, we did this graph last time. If I write here bad and good effects on physiology, the input to the HP axis, you don't want it to be too low or too high. If it's too low, like if you don't have cortisol, you die first of all because of heart failure. A little bit, you get you're very fatigued and depressed, so you have to take cortisol pills. Here in the middle is optimal stimulation. It's when you were born to do this. You can't wait to come to work. You are creative. You are full of energy. You're energized. You can run away from the line. You can do that. That's the, that's the optimal. And above that, you have chronic stress, depression, like you said, the other side of depression, too high cortisol. You shut down. You have prime to negative stimuli. So there's a sweet spot for cortisol optimal level. And we also mentioned last time that there's a receptor called MR that gets saturated in this region, and there's another receptor, GR, that's in charge of this region. So this takes the chronic stress aspects and this takes the let's say, positive stimulatory aspects of cortisol. You need cortisol to wake up in the morning, right? You get a burst of cortisol in the morning. That gives you the energy to get up. Without it, we still be like zombies. So. Now, suppose now you're a human being. You're born into some culture. Your genes have no idea what culture you're born to. Is it 
better to write haikus or to beat someone in the head with a axe. What is what is this culture? Okay, what is what's what's going on here? What do I need to do in this culture? How do I get my stimulus? Uh, you don't know. You don't know. And things also keep changing. Your behavior, optimal behavior, to get the best reward changes with the people around you, the situation, the climate, the world. You see, you're clueless. You need a navigation device that can help you learn the behaviors that are rewarding. This problem, so basically when you can imagine a kind of abstract behavior space, okay, so you have behavior one, behavior two, what should I do? Okay, should I go to Charlie, should I go to Kalanaf? Where, where should I go right, to get the best salad? It keeps changing, Whatever, what should I do? Okay. And somewhere is this behavior that will give you the optimal stimulation. You wanna find that place, right? You go, wanna go up the gradient of stimulation. That's the kind of problem you need to, to solve. Now, there's, I'm going to jump now to a different organism that has a kind of analogous problem, much simpler problem, but also a very, very difficult problem of searching. But it's not searching in behavior space, it's ser searching in real space, x, y, z. So. And this is the bacterium, E. coli. So it has this flagella, it helps it swim. If I put a pipette here, and there's these gradients of, chem of attracting the food, of something the bacteria likes, this is concentration. So here I have my pipette concentration gradient, bacteria will do this kind of random walk and will find its way. But the amazing thing about it is the bacteria is so small, it tries to swim straight for 10 seconds, Brownian motion changes its direction by 90 degrees. So it has no idea where it is, and even if it knew which way to go, let's say north, soon enough the wind's going to blow it in a different direction. So should I answer this call? Shouldn't I? What will give me the best stimulus? <laughs> I think the best stimulus will be to continue with this class. So, so stimulating. And how do, so you see, the transition straight for 10 seconds, they're going to be oriented like this. So they have no idea where they're going or where they are, but they can still find the pipette. And they can do this across five orders of magnitude. And, and hearing the, because I have full chain detection in my hearing, I can hear the tiny little rings here on the background. So shut up, shut off my phone here. Ha, feel. They're a rush of, a rush of you now because I'm in control. <laughs> I'm in control of my life, I'm in control of my cell phone. I'm not addicted to my cell phone. <laughs> I can stop at any time. <laughs> By the way, the criteria for uh, substance abuse, <coughs> you need two of the following nine, right? They include Using, using it more than I would like, being, not being able to stop, having withdrawal syndromes, using it when it's physically dangerous, like when you're driving, using it even though it's hurting your relationship. And these, if you have six out of the nine, you're severely addicted, if you have two out of the nine, rather. So that's the DSM right there. And it's the same criteria for all these addictive things, which is interesting. It's a part of this universal curve, right? What is, it, what is addiction? So uh, how, do, how do bacteria achieve this? They have a circuit that's mathematically bacteria achieve this thing called chemotaxis. Chemotaxis means they see a chemical and they call a taxi <laughs> to, to go there. So inside they have a circuit that's mathematically analogous, math mathematically analogous. That's, a, that's so beautiful to see, to HPA. What, what, is that, what does that mean? It's just like our equation, dA dt equals x2 minus aA times a. They have an equation where the binding constant of their receptor for attractant goes like something like this. So, and this is the thing that's controlling their rate of changing direction. They have the same equation, which makes them have exact adaptation and full change detection. So you give them pulses of attractant, they respond, you double the full the attractant, they respond, you double again, they respond again. So they have like mathematically analogous. Uh, what are they doing? Their, their, their strategy is very simple. If things get better, keep going. That's their strategy. So they look at the attracting concentration where they are. If it's increasing, 
because of their derivative. They don't change direction. If it's decreasing, they randomly change direction. That's their strategy. So we can, because of this mathematical analogy, we can propose that human being now in behavior space, you're doing a behavior and your stimulation over weeks, right, increases. You get more beta endorphin, which tells you reward, learn this thing. But then you adapt. Just like bacteria adapt. And then you have the drive to go, keep going up the gradient. Okay. So from a method, we're, I'm talking, by the way, about stimulus taxes. This is the word we invented. To go up the gradient like this. Up to this. When you go too high, there's all this GR, all this depression thing we studied last time, which tells you you've gone too far, shut down, change the direction. That's what we studied last time. But there's another mechanism that's stopping you from going, exploring too much. And one way to think about the HPA axis with its glands and all this design is it's a convergent evolution to a very smart search strategy that works when you have virtually no information and no control. Only thing you can do is keep going or change direction. Mathematically uh, encoded by equations that give you exact notation, pole change detection. The downside is that you can, if you have substances that, that, that give you that reward, you, you can get addicted. And then your whole world shrinks to a one dimensional seeking of more of that substance. And then you have addiction. Uh, and by the way, in my postdoc, I did experiments. I addicted bacteria, basically. Now I know. <laughs> I gave them, I just added this attractant, like a step of attractant. And watch them. They, they get attracted. No matter which direction they're going, they say, oh my god, things are getting better. And they start swimming like this. And then with the, for them, it's, uh, it's like minutes, not weeks. Right? And then they say, oh, we've been fooled. And they start. So they adapt. They adapt back. And, so I use that to understand the material Texas circuit. Basically getting them into the maintenance level, and now they're like, if I take away the attraction, <laughs> they start taking it because they get into withdrawal, then it goes away. So now I can think of my postdoc as kind of addicting bacteria to alpha methyl aspartate uh, attractant. Yeah. So, so there's been studies recently on uh, using microdoses of things like LSD and psilocybin to get people to wean people off of certain addictions. Like if they're the smoking, nicotine, microdosing of some something else, some other things can help you off that. Is there any kind of insight from this model as to why that So what you're saying, what I understand from what your comment is that you go off cigarettes and you go into this phase of low bed endorphins. And now you give a different stimulant, not cigarettes. And what that should do in our model is, is supply that, but with a different modality. So it's not nicotine again, but a different modality, which is maybe helpful. And that sounds, may make sense to me. But maybe with this kind of model, you can think about yeah, quantitative terms, when to do it and how much. And it's always the same signal and basically. Or? No, it's, um, you ask me if it's always the same signaling molecule. So do, do I understand correctly? Same receptor. Same receptor, no. It's not the same receptor. The, each one of these alcohol, cocaine, exercise, opiates, gambling, THC, I don't know about gambling and sex, but THC works on the cannabinoid receptors. Okay. And for, uh, nicotine works on uh, opium, on the opium receptors, cocaine, SSRI inhibitor, kind of like a, not a, a reuptake. And alcohol works in so many places, GABA and glutamate receptors. So it's interesting that in the brain they have very, very different modes of action. One of the common denominators is they all activate the HPA axis, also by different ways, but they definitely do. So, so maybe, maybe there's an advantage to using a, a, an orthogonal receptor system. Like these. But those are very interesting thoughts, how to use this kind of understanding to Fight addiction in different ways. How do you calculate the dose? Calculate the dose or the time, or what to measure. Like if you measure red endorphins in 
in X3 and X2 and X1, maybe you can understand where you are in your trajectory or about relapse. There was a question? I just, just want to understand that. Is there a principle how we kind of get into a substance that does work on the HP uh, axis but does not have very bad side effects and is accessible? Let's say exercise. You treat it very well. Yeah, exercise. So it shouldn't be. A of course, exercise could eventually hurt your relationships work if you. That can also happen, but right? you say, is there something intrinsically wrong with being addicted just to an HP? I don't know. I have to think about it. And I mean, definitely, it takes your physiology to a different set point. So, one thing I'm guessing is that it would do is make you less able to get joy from other stimuli because of the higher cortisol that you have shutting down the, this is this blunted response. So I'm guessing you have kind of a more limited spectrum of what gives you joy. Do you agree on that? With that? The, whatever, same as the HP axis, you have more hedonic dysregulation to others? Yes, and, the, and eventually. Eventually after weeks. So. Yeah. So that's, I think, uh, so from a humanistic point of view, maybe it limits you. Um, um, fascinating topic, I think. What's, what else? What's, yeah. How about um, uh, gradual um, withdrawal, withdrawal? Okay, so the question is gradual withdrawal. So instead of crashing, doing this, right? So just like you do with dexamethasone or drugs like that, could, could maybe be a better strategy. And I, I'm guessing that for psychological reasons, it's more difficult to do that. Thing, but for psychological reasons, right. but I, I don't know. I mean, you have to or perhaps you can switch it to the orthogonal uh, input of exercise and then, and then increase. Yeah, the so switch to the orthogonal input of exercise to help you out. Right? That's definitely known to happen. And by the way, no, and then decrease it gradually. And then decrease it gradually, exactly. And also, there's drugs that work on, for example, there's a drug called the uh, methadone for heroin addiction. What methadone does is, it's a, it's, so op opiates like heroin bind, but they also unbind. Once they unbind, the methadone sneaks in and shuts off the, you know, it binds the receptor really tightly. So it's kind of like, but it binds it, but it doesn't give the effects. So it's like, just, so it doesn't give you, let's say, the euphoria. So it's just like, so you can so those drugs um, can help a person um, have less withdrawal symptoms and kind of so those and there's for alcohol there's drugs that for example inhibit the enzyme that metabolizes alcohol makes you have hangover immediately when you drink which is not pleasant and then that kind of gives you negative reinforcements so it's all kind of approaches. And by the way, the very important in addiction is in psychological approaches are, are probably essential. So there's something called motivational interviewing, which is a, a kind of interview series you do with the person to help them identify. It's a very interesting. It's, it's open questions that help the person identify why, what are the reasons that they use, use the substance. What are the reasons they, they want to stop? I mean, each person has a different reason. What are the barriers to stopping? Like that, with that kind of, just the interviewing, it builds motivation because the person can't identify. But it, it's, you have to, you meet a lot of resistance when you do motivational interviewing. And the, the, the listening skill is to what's called role with resistance, is to assume the person is an expert on themselves and if they have a reason to keep using, it's a good reason. They know themselves. So they, to, to go with it. And after you go with it enough, the person gets to the point where they say, okay, but there's another side. Maybe I want to stop. So it's like a special kind of listening that I want to just mention because if any of you are interested in know someone who, who has addiction or more interested in active listening, so I'm going to write this motivational interviewing. It's a very well-researched motivational interview. If you want to change a habit, or help somebody change a habit. 
in a very humanistic way, very respectful. Yeah, this is nice. And the other thing that's effective is peer groups. So you have a group of people like the 12 step program that makes good, you build a commitment to stop, and you also have others that hold you accountable. So they ask, okay, like the, you have a buddy that holds you accountable. And those things also important for getting through the withdrawal period, along with the medications. But it's far from a solved problem. You know, this, as I said in the beginning, heroin addiction, then opiate addiction, alcohol addiction, nicotine, so there's massive amount of teenage death because of overdoses, because of the tolerance effect. So there's a lot, a lot to do in the field of addiction. Let's take a nice eat, Sarah, relief. <sighs> Maybe along that last question. Yeah, if lowering uh, adrenal uh, volume before uh, getting into rehab, basically this model can cause, uh, can prevent uh, relapse. So you say somehow doing this? Not, not uh, here, yeah, but yeah. to some, some yeah. yeah, I agree. You see the comment is that manipulating the HPA axis can, according to this model, uh, help. So I think that offers interesting targets to consider. Okay. Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> okay, special lecture next time, a special topic, special vibe. Hope to see you next week. <laughs>